So today we're going to talk about the cardiac fast. Um, last week we talked about the abdominal fast, um, and this is kind of our mini series about the fast exam. Today is a cardiac fast. And again, picture from a one season wonder trauma or show about trauma is kind of fun. But. All right. So as we get started, think about it in the context of uh, a couple cases again. Um, Let's say you're working down in the ED uh, on your next trauma shift. It's 11:30 p.m. and you get paged out for a 16-year-old who was shot in the chest. The vitals look horrible. Hypotensive, tachycardic, lungs seem to be working fine. What are you gonna do? Or 54-year-old female found out. Okay, we don't know how long. Cardiac arrest and arrival. Paramedics do their thing. They bring them in, roll into the trauma bay. Now what? All right. Or, 64-year-old male stabbed to the chest on the left side. That doesn't actually look that bad. 154.92, heart rate 100, respirators 18, 99% on room air. Okay? So these are all different patients that can be seen downstairs, probably have been seen downstairs in some way, shape, or form, in which the ultrasound may or may not affect our clinical management. And I'll emphasize may, because this is ultrasound lecture. So... Uh, part of this being a little bit out of, out, of, out of order, we're kind of rearranging the order here, but last week we talked about the abdominal fast, okay? We talked about the role of the ultrasound in finding hemoperitoneum, okay, in patients who are unstable from a traumatic source. Next week, um, if all things work out as, as anticipated, we're going to talk about the thoracic fast, okay? Um, how ultrasound can affect our evaluation of the thorax, the lungs, the, per, uh, the pleural space. Uh, but today we're really going to focus in on the cardiac component, okay? Hemopericardium, pericardial tamponade, how, how patients in tra who are traumatized, um, you know, can be helped with the ultrasound, you know, specifically to evaluate the heart. So, again, this should be familiar and should be review. Uh, the four different basic cardiac, or four different basic windows of the FAST exam. Uh, up top, we have the sub subcostal or subxiphoid. Um, we have the right upper quadrant, the pelvic, and the left upper quadrant. And we talked about the various different places that free fluid should show up there. As a little bit of a sneak peek, um, this is a thoracic component, you know, looking for uh, pleural effusion, uh, looking for uh, pneumothorax. And then today, uh, we're going to talk about the heart specifically. We're going to narrow in on just the heart itself um, and kind of what we can learn about how to evaluate the heart with ultrasound in the critical care patient or in the traumatized patient. All right, so uh, because of uh, the requirements of CME, uh, here are objectives, and just for those of us who like to organize things throughout the course of the lecture, we're going to talk about um, the indications and techniques to do the cardiac fast. We're going to talk about the different sonographic findings uh, of pleural fusion, or pericardial fusion, excuse me, and a pericardial tamponade. Um, and then we're going to discuss the role of cardiac ultrasound uh, in cardiac arrest. All right? And I uh, forgot to put the slide in, but for those of you who are wondering, no, I did not pick up any disclosures over the last week, so I still have no disclosures. Uh, so cardiac fast, okay? The whole idea, if we boil it down to just a one sentence thing, right? When, whenever you're talking about pitching a product or pitching a, you know, an idea, you always want to boil it down to the, your, your elevator pitch, your one liner. So if you can walk into an elevator and say, hey, I'm, a, I'm Matt, this is what I do, you can say it in one line so you can kind of get the idea. So the, the elevator pitch, the one liner for the cardiac fast is it's a rapid assessment of global cardiac function, all right, and looking for immediate cardiac life threats, all right? That's the whole point. Okay, in the trauma bay, when we have a trauma surgeon looking over our shoulder, wondering what we're seeing on the ultrasound, or when we take the time to do this on a patient who is crumping, the whole point is to look for, is there heart beating, and is there anything that is, we need to immediately intervene upon from a cardiac standpoint um, based on our ultrasound, okay? And so, when we kind of parse that out a little bit, you know, we're looking for causes of hemodynamic instability, right? So the patient's crumping in front of us. You know, they're hypotensive, they're tachycardic, or maybe they're not tachycardic, maybe they're bradycardic, you know. Um, or, hey, you know what, I'm concerned this patient may actually go south on me. They've shown some early signs of badness. Uh, what's going on so I can be prepared, okay? Data is always good. Um, in this context, we're looking at, is there cardiac activity, yes or no? Um, and is there pericardial fluid with tamponade physiology, yes or no, okay? So, from uh, an indication standpoint, again, um, we can define you know, narrowly or broadly, but basically, um, patients who are in cardiac arrest, I think, you know, it's always a good idea uh, to do, a or do, a, do an ultrasound uh, to look at their cardiac activity. There's some, um, some pushback in, a, you know, with a recent article about how, you know, cardiac ultrasound can prolong a pulse check. Um, the average time of ultrasound guided pulse checks was 21 seconds. The average time for a 
non-ultrasound guided pulse checks was 13 seconds in the, in the opinion of the authors. They said this was unacceptable, and Twitter has kind of lit, lit on fire with that one recently. We can talk about that at some other time. But anyway, I think ultrasound has a, a strong role in, in you know, the cardiac arrest patient. You know, there's also a strong role in the patient who's hemodynamically unstable. You know, talk to the, the folks in the MICU, talk to the trauma folks. When a patient's crumping in the ED, okay, and we don't know what it is, ultrasound is very strongly indicated because it really helps us guide our management. We learned about that last week. We're going to learn about that more this week, okay? Um, and then the other one, and this is kind of a, the other one you got to think, you know, kind of open up your perspectives to is, you know, whether there's potential trauma to the, you know, what we call the cardiac box, right? So the clavicles to the belly button, nipple to nipple, essentially, is the cardiac box. So if there's any trauma that's in that box or trauma that has the potential of penetrating through the box, um, it, it's a good idea to do cardiac ultrasound, do ultrasound in that situation. Uh, because, I mean, let's face it, what's inside the box? It's the mediastinum. The mediastinum's got a lot of important things. Heart, pericardium, great vessels, high of the lungs, some of the lungs themselves. Injuries to those have a, a high probability of, you know, causing the patient to go south rather quickly. So we'll see, you'll see this in the trauma bay when you work trauma shift. Um, you know, the, the surgeon, the, the, the trauma surgeons are very, very eager to have you do an ultrasound uh, when there's a penetrating trauma to the chest because they want to know, um, is this someone who's got impending badness uh, going on? So from a machine standpoint, uh, we're going to use a phased array transducer. This is a new one from last week. Um, um, it's not, it's, uh, you know, it's got a narrow footprint, okay? It's a low frequency transducer, okay? So it's going to be able to penetrate into the body quite well. Um, you know, but it has a, it's a very unique transducer to allow you know really good imaging through the costal margin you know of the heart okay and we can have we have a debate kind of in the office of is this the best transducer or is the curvilinear the best transducer and depends on who you ask you'll get different answers I tend to like this one uh, for everything in the fast exam in the cardiac component this is really going to be your best friend okay it's going to get through those ribs real well and you'll evaluate the heart you know quite nicely um, and you want to make sure when you're doing it to be looking either with the fast or the cardiac preset. Okay. Again, presets are there to help you. They're not there to give you an extra step. Um, they basically set all the machine functions to optimize for what you're you're intending to look for. Um, you know, making it easy for you to, to do it in a, in a hurry. Okay. Because the, the the most stressful thing in the, you know in doing cardiac ultrasound or doing ultrasound in general is when you have someone looking over your shoulder wanting to know what your findings are so they can intervene. Okay. So when you're in trauma setting. You know, you have that unstable patient. You're looking. You have that trauma surgeon <coughs> looking over your shoulder saying, "Hey, what do you find? What do you find?" You know, it's important, you know, you're, you're playing an important role, but it's also stressful because you're trying to give that answer quickly. Uh, so a lot of things need to happen. All right, so use your presets. From a patient standpoint, you know, some of this is going to be dictated just by the mechanics of, of trauma, right? They're going to be in the supine position. They're in spinal precaution still. We haven't had a chance to clear their spines. So they're in the supine position. But sometimes if you can't get a good view, you may need to roll them into the left lateral DQ, okay? Especially in the medical patient where you're looking for, you know, um, looking for good windows of the heart, getting them onto the left side will pull that heart more towards the chest wall and give you a better window, um, you know, into the heart through, you know, with the ultrasound uh, than potentially laying them supine. So you may not have a lot of choices. Um, you know, this is oftentimes going to be the way you're going to find them in the trauma bay. So as for windows, you know, basically we're going to talk about two windows today. There's multiple windows in cardiac ultrasound. That's a discussion for more of a broad um, a broad discussion about cardiac ultrasound in general, but we're again we're limiting it down to the critical patient in the trauma bay uh, who, are, who are acutely traumatized or the severely you know unstable medical patient. All right, so really it all boils down to two windows that are really really helpful for you. Okay, and you can expand up and you know you know from there. Uh, but it's going to be the subcostal window and the parasternal long axis window. Okay, so the subcostal window, like its name implies, um, is going to be from you know, the subcostal region. So where the, the costal margins come up and form the, you know, from the xiphoid essentially, that little window there is where we're going to be placing our probe. And we're looking through the liver. The liver is very echogenic. It transmits sound very well. Uh, and it's a great window to look at the heart. Okay, we can kind of, the lungs are usually out of the way. And you kind of look at the base of the, or the apex of the heart there. And you're going to see something to this effect. All right. On the, on the ultrasound screen, you're going to see something to this effect. All right. So here we have basically a subcostal view looking up toward the, uh, toward the heart from beneath the xiphoid process, all right? And if we put some labels on, we can see our anatomy, all right? So the base of our heart is over to the left, 
Okay, we have our left atrium, our right atrium, we have our left ventricle, okay, and our right ventricle. And this bright white line surrounding it is going to be our pericardium. It's a very common window that we're going to be utilizing. The parasternal long axis, okay, is another one. I use these two interchangeably, so if you can't get one, I jump to the other. If you can't get the, you know, this one, you jump back to the sub subcostal. Uh, but parasternal long axis, like its name implies, is done parasternally, okay? It's going to be done just to the left of the costal margin, or the, the sternum, um, in usually the second or third intercostal space, uh, with our probe indicator angling um, in the long axis of the heart. So the heart goes kind of basically from right shoulder to left hip, right? Just kind of in that angulated position. Um, so our probe indicator is going to angle, um, or our probe axis is going to angle kind of in this 45-ish degree trajectory. Um, and depending on which mode you're in, in in cardiac ultrasound, which we'll get into, you know, we'll talk about it another time, um, your indicator will be pointed towards the, the hip or shoulder. Um, uh, but basically, you're going to point your indicator in a manner so that you get the, the, the left ventricle, which is the pro prominent ventricle in this, this view, pointing towards the left side of the screen. Okay? Uh, so on the ultrasound, you look at it like this. So we have our left ventricle. All right? Our left atrium is here, kind of at the base of the heart, kind of on the right side. Uh, this little ventricular space uh, that is on the anterior portion, or the very superficial portion of the heart, is going to be our right ventricular <coughs> outflow tract. In between our RVOT and our left atrium, we have our left ventricular outflow tract with the aortic valve. Uh, you can see the mitral valve as well, kind of flapping here between that left atrium and the left ventricle. Does that make sense? Kind of a, from an orientation standpoint. Uh, surrounding the heart, again, is your pericardium, the bright white hyperechoic line. And again, off to the periphery, we have lungs. You can see the, you know, the, the B lines here coming off the lungs. So I'll put some labels on here. Again, right ventricular outflow tract, LVOT, LA. Here's a left ventricular, left ventricle, the pericardium right here. And a very, very important landmark feature that you're going to see in this window is a descending thoracic aorta. It's oftentimes going to be just deep to your left atrium right here. Okay? And we want to see that in the view because that's going to allow us to determine if, if there's an effusion, where that effusion you know, is taking place. All right? Questions so far? So that's the mechanics of what we're looking at, it's anatomy and kind of how we get it. Let's spend the rest of our time talking about the clinical, okay? Because that's really where it matters. You know, we can have this huge didactic understanding of the cardiac ultrasound, but until it impacts patient care, it means nothing, right? So we're going to talk about it from three different perspectives. We're going to look at it and how we how we diagnose uh, and what a pericardial fusion looks like, okay? Then we'll take that one step further and say, is this pericardial fusion representing tamponade physiology? Okay, that's what we want to know. Um, and then we'll switch gears at the end and talk about cardiac activity assessment, particularly in the, the cardiac arrest patient. All right? So from effusion, right? Pericardial effusions happen. They happen from a trauma standpoint. They happen from a medical standpoint. There's many, 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 many different causes of pericardial effusion. We can talk about it in dialysis patients. We can talk about it in cancer patients. We can also talk about patients who are shot in the chest, right? So there's many different th causes. The acuity of them varies depending on the cause. And what you need to do about it varies based on what the cause and how the patient's presenting, okay? The physiologic consequences of a pericardial effusion isn't necessarily, you know, um, affected by its presence or, or absence, but really it's affected by the rate at which that accumulates. Someone can go throughout their life and have a small pericardial effusion or even a moderate pericardial effusion and be just fine as long as that's not rapidly accumulating, okay? Whereas someone who's not used to a pericardial effusion is shot, all of a sudden has blood around their heart, it's going to cause them to crump quite, quite quickly, even to, with a small degree of fluid there. All right. Clinically, or, or sonographically, it, it appears as an echopore space surrounding the heart. I mean, that just makes sense. And it's an effusion, it's pericardial. So, um, you know, we know that fluids tend to be anechoic, um, and by nature of it being a pericardial effusion, it's going to surround the heart, right? Um, it's often seen in gravity-dependent areas. Again, this makes sense. If you lay someone down, you know, air is going to rise to the top, solids and, and fluids are going to sink to the bottom. So it can be seen in a gravity-dependent area, which will depend on the patient's positioning. In a supine patient, it tends to be deep in the, the screen versus in the superficial areas of the screen. Um, and it will track, and this is why I mentioned the thoracic aorta on the parasternal lung, it tracks anterior to the, the descending thoracic aorta. Okay, and think about it, you know, in anatomically. You have your mediastinum, okay, your sternum, go back a layer, you have your heart, 
go back to layer, you have your great vessels, go back to layer, you have your spine, okay? So when you put fluid around that heart, it's gonna be between the heart and between the, those great vessels, okay? If it comes up to the side and stops at the, at the, the great vessels, we're looking at a different cavity. We're looking at a pleural cavity versus the one that goes right in front of the great vessel being the pericardial space. So if you see an effusion, like we see here, okay, this one's tracking anterior to that descending thoracic aorta. Those are the pericardial effusion. Contrast that with a pleural effusion that would come up to the th thoracic aorta and stop and go down this way. Does that make sense? Questions about that so far? It's I'm sorry. It's up there too. Yes. Yeah. So, good point. So, when they get large enough, they'll track all the way around the heart. Small effusions will collect in a gravity dependent area. So, in this, if this patient's supine, right? This is anterior, this is posterior. So, it means this is face up, this is the bed. So, you're going to see it initially collect down here. And as it gets larger and larger and larger, it'll collect up here. With the proviso, that it's not a loculated pericardial space. You know, there's not previous surgery causing adhesions and such. Make sense? So here's another example. And when they get too large, they can be quite prominent. It can be hard to miss, okay? We have this, a very, um, very large thickened LV, okay? Um, and fairly decently sized pericardial effusion. All right, other, other windows can be helpful in determining um, the effusion, okay? We didn't talk about the parasternal short axis, but if you go 90 degrees off the parasternal long, you're gonna get basically this donut view of the heart. You can even see that pericardial effusion collecting here, okay? As well as up here. Here's that subcostal window, okay? You can see the effusion collecting in the gravity-dependent area and wrapping around up to the very superficial areas uh, in the least gravity-dependent area as well. Does it make sense? All right. Ignore the color flow on this one. Um, this has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But if you kind of come out towards more of an apical window, um, you can even see them over here. There's that descending thoracic aorta again. Fusion is tracking around. So it can be seen in multiple windows. Now, one of the things that you know may complicate this. You know, this is easy enough when you see these pictures. But one of the things that may complicate this is something called an epicardial fat pad. So as we get older, okay, we tend to collect fat in places we don't like to collect it in. You know, it's lovingly referred to as, to, as dresser syndrome, right? When your chest drops into your drawers, okay. Um, we all just kind of generate, you know, fat in different places. We see this, in the, you know, in the belly. Uh, you can see that around the heart, okay. So one of the things that you can have is this fat pad, kind of the anterior border of the heart, okay. Uh, and it tends to be anterior to the RV, okay? And it shows up as, you know, this echogenic thing with low-level echoes that move with the cardiac cycle, right? So if you look here, this could easily be mistaken for a pericardial effusion, okay? There's an echo pore space uh, between that right ventricle and the pericardium. But if you look at it closely, there's little echoes in there, okay? Uh, and they kind of tend to move back and forth with that cardiac cycle, okay? Additionally, we don't really see a lot going on posteriorly. Uh, so this would be an example of a patient with an epicardial fat pad. So something you got to watch out for, right? It can easily be a false positive, um, you know, when you're doing cardiac ultrasound on older folks. Uh, but it can just as easily be something that you, you know, you know, see, uh, you know, see something, and, you know, blow it off as just a fat pad. So you got to be real careful and kind of screen posteriorly as well here. All right. So let's talk about tamponade. Okay. When does a pericardial effusion become tamponade? You know, like we said, they may have a effusion. It may not be a big deal. They may have been driving to Metro to see their doctor about their effusion and crash their car, and now you happen to notice it, right? Um, so when does this become something we need to worry about? When does it become a tamponade physiology, okay? Tamponade essentially is a clinical diagnosis that we use ultrasound to help us make, okay? It's not necessarily a sine qua non, this is, you know, the pathognomonic thing. It's a constellation of findings that you know, we then interpret in the clinical context, much like cholecystitis, you know. There's a lot of findings that suggest cholecystitis. Each of them individually are very poorly predictive, but when you put them all together with the patient's finding, you know, you come up with a diagnosis, right? And to that effect, or to that extent, um, you know, to that degree, it's, it's not a binary thing, right? It's not a, you have tamponade, you don't. I mean, we read about it in textbooks, and you say, hey, this is what tamponade presents like, okay? But when you see it in clinically, you see, hey, this is a spectrum disorder. You know, you don't all of a sudden, boom, you, you know, become tamponade. Uh, it's something that develops over time. You know, one of the patients that I remember who I had scanned for tamponade, 
Now I'm say, hey, scan them, you know, their vitals are a little soft. Call a cardiologist, okay, this is tamponade. You gotta come down here right away. Um, they came down and they uh, said, no, it's actually pre-tamponade. Okay, so in that particular case, I think it was just, you know, they wanted to get the patient upstairs before they admitted I was ready. But um, that being said, it is true to say that as something accumulates, your hemodynamically, your hemodynamics are going to change. And I have a case of that, you know, um, that I'll show an example from later. Okay, so it's not a binary thing; it's, it's a spectrum thing. It, it will develop over time, but the rate of accumulation is really the, the the thing that's important. Okay, more even more than the size, right? You can have a long-standing pericardial effusion and it'd be ginormous, okay, uh, and not be in tamponade physiology. But if you're shot, right, or if you have this acute insult to your pericardium you know, it's going to present with a very, very small size of fusion and be very clinically significant, okay? Um, and in the case of trauma patients, you know, this leads to a high degree of mortality. And Bob's t Bob can tell you stories afterwards about patients he saw, you know, when he was training prior to ultrasound, you know, who just precipitously deteriorated, right, um, from this exact thing. And this is kind of why we're using it in the trauma base. So we get a head start and know, hey, you know what, this patient's not heading in the right direction, right? So... Again, it kind of goes without saying, a pericardial effusion uh, is fluid kind of around the heart, okay, within the pericardial sac. So normally there's a, the sac, it contains a minuscule amount of fluid. Um, but as we put fluid in there pathologically, um, that's going to create, you know, problems, right? It's going to create pressure, um, you know, back on the heart. And as the heart kind of, if it, if it accumulates slowly, the heart can adapt to that. But if it accumulates rapidly, that pressure back on the heart is going to cause the, the hemodynamic, you know, consequences. So... Like we were saying, the rate of accumulation is critical. This is an example from or a chart from the New England Journal, um, and a very good article they had about tamponade. Um, you know, really illustrating there comes a point when your pericardium can't stretch any further, where you can't accommodate any more fluid, and to put more in is going to squeeze stuff out. Much like you know, from a neuro perspective, when you herniate, right? You have a closed box, um, you know, that you can't put too much thing, too many things in. Okay, and so if you put blood um, in and around the brain. And increase that pressure within you know a closed calvarium, uh, something's going to give, right? You're going to herniate. Uh, and in this situation, the thing that's going to give in the heart uh, is the filling of the heart. Okay, when you put pressure on that heart inside a closed pericardium, it's going to limit the ability of that heart to fill. Okay, so if it fills, if that pericardium fills rapidly, you're going to achieve that that limit, that pericardial that that tamponade limit, a lot sooner than if you have this slow effusion that develops over time. Does it make sense? Okay. Now think about it from a chamber's perspective, right? This will help us understand the, the, the physiology moving, you know, moving along the next few slides. Okay. So as, as blood enters from the, the periphery, right, it comes in through the SVC and the IVC, all right, and it enters in the right atrium. Your right atrial pressures tend to be less than five, zero to five, depending on where you are in the cardiac cycle, right? That blood then goes into the right ventricle and is pumped out. And that blood, you know, is pumped out at a little bit higher pressure, okay, but still, a pretty low pressure. I mean, the, the, the lungs are a low, pre low, low pressure circuit, right? Um, and the only reason why we can able, you know, have a little higher pressure and can keep and can maintain a systolic or diastolic pressure is just because of the valves, right? The valves keep you, have, keep you from having backflow um, and in, in turn kind of allow there just to be a little residual pressure kind of left over during the astole, uh, something that your, your, um, your right atrium doesn't have. All you have is your kind of your filling pressures in your right atrium to kind of prevent your backflow. Right, so there's the RV that's going to go out to the lungs. As it come back from the lungs, okay, you're going to have you know this modest pressure in your left atrium, and really the left ventricle is that pressure generating ventricle, right? Um, and that's where you have your high, you know, high pressure circuits. So as the pericardial space fills up with things, okay, that pressure on the heart is going to be increased, okay, um, and as such, once you start meeting and exceeding these filling pressures, things are going to go in the least you know, the, the, the path of least resistance, right? Um, and so if the, uh, you know, your pericardial pressure meets and exceeds your right atrial pressure, blood's not going to flow into it. Everything flows, you know, either downhill grab, from a gravity standpoint or down a pressure gradient, all right? So as we fill it up, and I apologize about a lot of charts, but I, I found these to be, or be pretty illustrative. Here's your pericardial pressure, okay? As you begin to fill that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to rise. And the first thing you're going to see is you're going to meet and exceed your right atrial pressure, okay? 
And as you meet and exceed that right atrial pressure and then your right ventricular pressure, you're going to see a decrease in your cardiac output because you have a decrease in your filling. If you can't fill your right atrium, you can't fill your right ventricle. If you can't fill your right ventricle, you can't fill your left ventricle. And it's just a cascade from there. Does that make sense? So if we put it in another way, here's your pericardial pressure and your chamber filling pressure. Okay? It's kind of like the law of supply and demand in economics. You, know, you have your supply meets your demand and there's that sweet spot. Okay? In this case, the sweet spot is where you know, that pressure has become, you know, get to a high enough degree that you're going to lose your, um, your cardiac output. So the first thing you're going to see sonographically is collapse of your right atrium okay? during systole. And you think about it, right? The lowest pressure, the lowest point, uh, point in the cardiac cycle where you're going to have, you know, the lowest pressure point in that cardiac cycle is at the end of systole. Okay? The, the whole role of the right atrium is to fill that, that, that right ventricle. So you're going to have passive filling um, you know, during diastole. Okay? That pressure is going to mount. It's going to mount. You have your systole of the right, right atrium. That's going to be your highest pressure. As that releases into your um, right ventricle, okay, that pressure is going to precipitously drop. So at the end of systole, you're going to have your lowest pressure as, you know, before it starts filling that right atrium back up again. Okay? So the first thing you're going to see, okay, the, the first place where the pericardial pressure is going to overwhelm the intra intra um, chamber pressures is going to be endosystole and right atrium. All right, so you see that here, right atrium, and you see that collapse of that right atrial wall. You all see that? Okay. So one source says that if that collapse is greater than one third of the cardiac cycle, it actually predicts to a high degree of sensitivity and specificity tamponade. Okay. I haven't, can't say I've ever called it exclusively on this, but hey, you know, if you see that, at least your radar should be going off and your, you know, your ears should be perking up to the potential for tamponade, especially in a patient who is you know, becoming unstable. The next thing you'll find is diastolic collapse of the, the right ventricle. And this is the classic thing you know, that you'll see on ultrasound, right? So and it, the, the same logic applies. The next lowest pressure okay, is going to be your ventricle um, and, you know, throughout its cardiac cycle, the right ventricle. Okay? So think about it again from this perspective. You have your diastolic filling, okay? The atria kind of starts filling it up. You have the atrial kick, right? That's going to increase your pressure. And so your highest pressure point is kind of at the end of diastole, right? Uh, right before that tricuspid valve blows open, uh, no, pulmonic valve blows open uh, and lets the blood out into the pulmonary circulation, right? Um, that's going to open up. Your tricuspid valve is going to close, okay? You're going to complete your systole. Now, at the beginning of diastole, you're going to start relaxing that ventricle. Both valves are going to be closed for a period of time until the right atrial pressure exceeds the, the valvular pressure, valve, valve opening pressure. And as that valve's opening, that tricuspid valves, you can start having pre um, blood flowing in. That's going to be your lowest pressure point in the cardiac cycle. And so that's the point um, in that early diastole when you're going to start seeing collapse of the right ventricle um, in, in tamponade physiology. So you can see here, okay, left right. Okay, I have it reversed from where it was before. So I apologize about that. There's a big, big effusion. We know it's right ventricle because it's the superficial ventricle in the subcostal window. Okay. Um, actually, I think it's a parasternal window. It's kind of a quirky parasternal. But you can see a collapse kind of of that right ventricular wall throughout that cardiac cycle. And it has a modest predictive value for, um, for tamponade, okay? If you don't have that, probably not in tamponade. If you do have that, there's a good chance you are in tamponade, okay? Here's another example. This is a subcostal, all right? You can see that RV wall just springing up and down. Someone described it as a, like someone jumping on trampoline. You see kind of that, that RV free wall springing up and down throughout the cardiac cycle with an effusion. That is the sine qua non. And the last thing we're going to talk about that's kind of suggestive of tamponade or is a, an element of tamponade physiology that we'll see sonographically is the, the IVC, okay, the size of the IVC, and, and, and specifically a uh, plethora of the IVC, large, you know, an enlargement of that IVC. Theoretically, you know, the IVC reflects your right atrial pressure, okay, um, assuming certain 
conditions aren't going on. Um, and, and I mean, I guess it'd be safe to say the RBC, IBC is a reflection of your right atrial pressure, and other conditions can affect that. So if you're an AFib and you're having a hard time getting things out of your atria, you can have a, an elevation of your you know, right ventricular, or right atrial pressure, and transmit it down to the IBC, because there's no valves, right? Um, so when you have uh, things that cause backup, okay, when you can't get blood forward, it's going to back up. You put a dam in a river, you get a lake behind it. The lake in this situation um, is going to be your IVC. You're going to have increased pressures in your IVC because you can't get the blood forward. Okay, so you're going to see this enlargement of this plethora uh, of the IVC. Whereas if you have good flow from your right atria to right ventricle, you're going to get forward movement into that blood, and your pressures you know are going to be a lot lower, and you'll see you know, more significant collapse of that IVC. So this carries with it a pretty decent sensitivity. If you got collapsed IVC in a patient who's hemodynamically unstable, you're probably not talking about tamponade. Okay? You probably have to start barking up another tree. Um, that being said, you know, plethora of the IVC in isolation is poorly you know, sense or specific or poorly predictive um, you know, of tamponade physiology. So it's something you have to interpret within the context of what's going on with the patient, both with the, the chamber collapse, the presence of infusion, and then this, married up with their clinical presentation and their hemodynamics. Does that make sense? What percentage collapse are you using? Uh, well, theoretically, the greater the, per the, greater the, um, the pressure here, the less it's going to collapse. So normal is considered to be less than 2 centimeters and about 50% collapse. So someone who's you know, volume depleted, hypovolemic, is going to have greater than 50% collapse and be less than 2 centimeters. Someone who's you know, got an elevated right atrial pressure, for whatever reason, should have less of a collapse and be greater than two centimeters. You know, that's been studied and, you know, someone's kicked around the 18% number and that has, you know, it works well when you take a bunch of med students and blood let them and then measure their hemodynamics. But when you apply that to the clinical scenario of a 90 year old who got into a car crash or a 16 year old who was just shot, those numbers don't hold up as cleanly. So I don't use a number. Uh, I use kind of a qualitative assessment and then correlate it clinically, essentially. The 18% is fluid responsiveness, not Correct. So the easy answer to your question is there is no single number. It's this a... looks like a flow IVC. Yes. All right. And I guess the one final thing here... Um, even for the amount of distension there, there's no threshold number. In general, the, a normal IVC should be two centimeters or less. So if it's... There's not, then there's not an upper Three is too much, four is too much. No. If it's over two, it's concerning. But all it, everything in this situation is always correlated with what the patient's doing. Uh, so the last part of our kind of march down the, the road to death here with tamponade physiology is RV collapse. Okay. So you'll have some diastolic collapse of that wall, but once you've kind of succumbed to that, you know, the pressure, the filling that you know so the total systolic pressure of that right ventricle, you're going to just get, collapse your RV and you're not going to get any filling. Okay? So in, that, in this situation here, we have quite a large echogenic uh, effusion, so blunt trauma arrest. Um, and you can see, here's our left ventricle. That right ventricle is nowhere. It's just completely collapsed. Okay? You're not allowed to fill. It's not being allowed to fill um, because it's just the pressure in the pericardium is too high. All right? So let's look at a few examples. For this, in this case, here's a person who came in. Um, this was the case I had when I was a fellow. Um, someone had a nail gun injury to the chest. So, you know, those big framing nailers, what they used to build houses with, they put in, you know, forget the exact, but like a 16 penny nail that the thing shoots in. Um, someone got blasted in the chest with that, and they had a, the, the head of that nail just kind of dimpling their chest wall. So that's buried in there somewhere not good. Okay, and it's in the box. Okay. So we needed to evaluate from a cardiac standpoint, okay? So here's a, the old sound, all right? You see the nail, tip of the nail in the left ventricle? See the pericardial effusion? What's going on with that diastolic free wall? Collapsing. Collapsing, okay? Now this was not the initial one. It was less prominent on the initial one. But it's actually interesting. The patient started off hemodynamically decent, okay? And over the course of their time uh, in the ED, uh, as we were waiting for the events to unfold to get them to the necessary OR, um, you know, that, that effusion accumulated, the sonographic findings worsened, um, and I forget what the pressure was when we left the department, it ended up doing well, um, but this is an example of something that we kind of were able to watch over the course of 15, 20 minutes as we were waiting for kind of things to be ready.
Um, so it's a perfect example of how the benefit of Olson in this scenario. Okay. What about this though? Okay, 25 year old male, again, this one's just made up, but it's something that you could easily see uh, in the ED. 25 year old male, status post gunshot wound to the chest. Okay, sounds like a reasonable place. I mean, I always grab the ultrasound on the way down to these when I'm when I get paged out. So let's throw a little bit of a, you know, a curveball in here. Paramedics say he lost pulses five minutes ago. We were on, um, you know, coming down West 25th and he lost pulses. We got here as fast as we could. Okay. You guys going to open them up? I mean, technically, the East guidelines suggest that within 15 minutes of losing pulses, you have the, it, it's reasonable to open up a, you know, a patient who has trauma, okay? Particularly trauma to the chest, all right? And I mean, the answer is pretty easy when trauma is here. But let's say we're out at, you know, a, a community hospital. You going to open them up, okay? And here's the problem, right? So we're all amped up. We're revved up on adrenaline. This is the big thing. This is the opportunity to make it or break it, right? And, um, and it's a, high, a prime opportunity to get stuck, okay? Whether it be on a rib fragment, whether it be on a patient, um, whether it be some, you know, unobservant resident who's doing the initial incision, cuts your finger, who knows? You know, this is a prime opportunity to get injured, okay? So this is a situation where ultrasound may be helpful, okay? Kim Jinamu out in California and his colleagues uh, published a study a few years ago looking at um, people who got resuscitative thoracotomy. Now, the, they're operating under the West guidelines, and the West guidelines are a little bit different than the East guidelines, but let's just assume for, all, for intensive purposes that you know, they're the same. I mean, when you're talking about opening people, it's relatively the same. I think East is a little bit more liberal with who they want to open, right? Um, but they basically enrolled a bunch of people uh, who got resuscitative thoracotomy and looked at, did the ultrasound really have any predictive effect um, you know, on, on these patients, okay? They didn't necessarily guide their management with the ultrasound, but they just kind of looked, they did the ultrasound, they opened them up, okay? And what they found, without going into too many of the details, is that if you'd have no activity on your cardiac ultrasound, fast negative, okay, your chances of survival is pretty slim, okay? Anyone that you're going to get back, okay? And they got a decent number back, okay? Anyone you're going to get back, they're going to have cardiac activity. So I think this is a pretty reasonable, um, you know, metric to use. Hey, I got someone who's been traumatized, okay? I'm doing their scan, you know, if there's no effusion, there's no need to really dig there, okay? If there's an effusion and they have no activity, the deed's probably done, there's not much you're gonna be able to get back, okay, statistically speaking. If they got some activity, it's fair game, okay? And this is pretty much accepted by the trauma surgeons here. I mean, when you have penetrating injury to the box, they wanna know, what do you see? Do I need to open them, okay? Or do we need to hustle up to the OR, All right? So, in this context, what do you think of this one? Would you open this patient? GSW to the to the chest. Would you open them? Yes or no? <laughs> to ect Kidding. Renal ectopia. <laughs> yeah. So this one, I mean, there's not much there. Okay. There's an effusion and not much in the way of cardiac activity. Okay, they're pretty much done. There's not much we can do. Okay, correlate or contrast that with this one here. Okay, this is a patient who actually survived and walked out of the hospital several weeks later. So we have a large effusion, echogenic, and we see a, an attempt at cardiac activity. It's not doing so well. The patient's definitely coded, but they're not. You know, they're not so far gone that you know they can't be salvaged. So this is someone that should be opened up in the ED. Okay, and someone who was and, and ultimately did well. Okay, questions? All right, so in the remaining time, we've got about 15 minutes left. Let's talk about the ultrasound and cardiac arrest. Okay, so we may be switching a little bit gears from trauma. I mean, it's certainly applicable to trauma, but also in the medical location. You know, we get the patient full, you know, 50 year old male full arrest. Okay, what do we do? Okay, um, so the two quick questions that you want to ask of ultrasound is Is there any cardiac activity? Okay, how far do I go with this thing? Am I ready to stop? Do I need to keep going? All right. And is there a reversible cause? Okay, if there's a reversible cause, people tend to get better if you reverse them versus if you leave them. Okay, and they tend to get better faster if you reverse them faster uh, than if you let them go longer. Okay, so ultrasound uh, has a role in helping us answer these questions. And really, in the context of you know of cardiac arrest, 
you know, we're all familiar with this. And in fact, I tell people, you know, when the patients get super sick, like they're dying sick like this, the medicine gets really easy. Do they shock them? Do we do CPR? Okay. But then the question is, what do we do beyond that? You know, um, if they aren't responsive to the shocking, if they're not responsive to the CPR, you know, what are those reversible causes and do we need to give other medicines? Knowing that when they're this far gone, you know, the other medicines aren't really helping as much as the good CPR. But this is something that we're all familiar with, right? We've all done our ACLS class, right? So we have, you know, the, the algorithm. They come in, they're not, the heart's not working. Do we shock it? Do we not shock it? And then what combination of CPR, medicines, and procedures do we need to do thereafter, okay? So the VFET, it's a little bit of an easier beast, right? It's less, less broad of a differential. But the PEA, right? You, have, you can have someone like this, or you can have someone like this. You can have asystole-ish things, or you have cardiac complexes, all right? And it all comes down to one thing. They have a pulse, right? Does the patient have a pulse? If they got a pulse, they're not necessarily in cardiac arrest. They're just under-resuscitated. We need to resuscitate them. If they don't have a pulse, okay, that's a whole different, you know, differential and a whole different beast. And that, that we need to assess rapidly. I mean, you get 10, 10 seconds off, you know, of, you know, time off chest when you're doing CPR. Um, otherwise, you're going to lose your cardiac perfusion, okay? Um, but you got 10 seconds to figure this out, okay? And what we know um, from personal experience as well as from the literature is that our fingers don't do a great job of determining whether you have a pulse, okay? This was a study done uh, basically to see how long it took folks to get, you know, figure out if there's a pulse, okay? Nurses and docs, pretty slow to figure this out, okay? Some got it in five, a lot more, a lot, a lot of people required more than 10 seconds to figure that out. Certainly doesn't hit our 10 second metric, right? And then we're talking about the accuracy uh, of diagnosing a pulse, a cryotic pulse. 38% of students were able to give an accurate, accurate diagnosis within 10 seconds. Okay, this is a study out of resuscitation 2000. So that means, you know, 50, a lot of, 62% of people weren't able to give the accurate, you know, result, or, you know, result of whether the patient had a pulse or not. And I mean, we know this, we feel the patient, feel the pulse and the patient in cardiac arrest and say, is it your pulse or is it theirs, you know? Um, so uh, we know clinically that, you know, the, the, the reliability of our fingers may not be as, as good as we think. So can ultrasound help there? So we, let's say we have a patient here, okay? Unresponsive, pulseless, we got this, all right? We see cardiac activity, well, that's totally different. That's an under-resuscitated patient that probably has a pressure that's low enough that's not transmitting a palpable pulse and needs to be uh, further resuscitated versus this, where your fingers aren't lying. There just isn't anything, right? So a lot of studies have been done, you know, to answer the question, when we see this, are we done? Okay, can we stop or do we have to keep going, right? Because the, 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 the important question in cardiac arrest, you know, other than is there something I can fix is when are we done, okay? Um, how long do I have to work this person to, to reassure myself, reassure the family that there's no, no survival? All right, so this has been studied in a number of ways. So the first study was out in 2001 by Chris Fox and Mike Blyvis. Basically said, you know what, if you got cardiac standstill, 100% predictive of death in the emergency department. It's a pretty clean number, okay? Nothing's ever 100%, but you know, that's a pretty clean number. And they did 136 people. This was a decent sized uh, cohort. Um, these folks, um, a few years later in uh, American Journal of Emergency Medicine, uh, basically said patients presenting without evidence of cardiac arrest, or cardiac activity, did not have ROS, uh, regardless of their rhythm. Okay, uh, so that's again pretty significant. Uh, we always have to throw a fly in the ointment. Okay, we got to muddy the water a little bit. So these folks, um, a few years later, uh, published a study basically saying, well, it's good, but not a zero percent chance of survival. Okay, um, the best article to date, uh, the most comprehensive one, was one that was published about a year ago. Um, by a whole bunch of folks, okay, you'll recognize a whole bunch of names here, um, you know, of, of major ultrasound um, folks, you know, nationally, looking at basically, does ultrasound predict, you know, survival and cardiac arrest? And they kind of found, you know, just like the last one, that, um, that it was good, um, but not perfect. So if you have no cardiac, you know, activity on your ultrasound, you got a pretty low percentage of survival. Um, so it's a pretty decent metric to guide off of, but it's always, again, not 100%. You've got to correlate a little bit. What about this one? 
Who wants to take a stab at this one? You got a 54-year-old male. I don't know how old this patient is, but let's make it up. 54-year-old male. Brought in by EMS. Family said, he was talking to me, clutched his chest and fell over. It's been not responsive since. What do you guys see? Besides the heart. Is there cardiac activity, yes or no? Is it organized cardiac activity, yes or no? Who wants to go fishing and pull worms out of a little bag? A pretty good hint. So this is B-fib, right? So you see that kind of the ventricular wall kind of fibrillating back, back and forth, that traditional bag of worms. So ultrasound can be used to help us decide are there reversible causes that we need to investigate or we need to to, to uh, you know, work on you know as the cause of this patient's cardiac arrest. Okay, so again, back to this original algorithm. Reversible causes come in two different places, right? Here, do we want to shock them? Or here, you know, the traditional H's and T's. Okay, so in the case that we we're talking about, this patient's in V-fib, probably needs a shock. Okay, and that's what we had. You know, we're doing a pulse check. Looked, you know, looked with the ultrasound. Like that's V-fib. Let's get off and shock. That's what we did. We went out and shocked. Okay, a uh, patient ended up not doing well, uh, but not for reasons of not for our trying. Um, so H's and T's, right? This is the the mnemonic that we go through in the ACLS classes, and that you can always remember to the end of your test and then forget, right? Um, but these are the reverse, the traditionally held reversible causes of cardiac arrest, and ultrasound can actually play a role in a number of these. And we're not going to talk about all of them today. Um, you know, we talked about trauma last week. We're not really going to talk about PE today, but there's certainly a role for ultrasound PE. Next week, we'll talk about tension pneumo. Okay, we talked about tamponade today, and then talk a little bit about volemia um, or volume status, right? Uh, so here's an example of you know collapsing IVC, kind of to your question of you know size and percent collapsibility. So if you have a patient who's got cardiac activity in this, I think they just need more, need, at least need more resuscitation. Okay, whether it be fluids or whether it need, needs to be well, first fluids, and then and followed by pressure once you kind of get your volume back up. Okay, in this in this setting, we talked about last week trauma. Okay, so this patient who's unstable, who's arresting, right? It's going to be a volume issue, you know, in large part. Here, this is kind of a preview for next week, but you, in the same way, you can put fluid in your belly, you can put fluid around your lungs. So you have a big pleural effusion. They're unstable. Um, this may be the cause, right? Um, again. Pneumothorax, I'm not going to spend a lot of time since that's going to be covered next week. Um, and then again, tamponade. Okay, so ultrasound can be utilized to evaluate for these reversible causes of, of patient's cardiac arrest. Right? So, in the very few minutes we have remaining, just kind of wrap things up. Remember, you want to have one liner elevator pitch of what cardiac ultrasound is all about. It's a rapid assessment of your patient's cardiac function, okay, and a rapid assessment for cardiac life threats. All right. We talked about those specifically in the context of does the patient have cardiac activity, yes or no, and is there a reversible cause of their arrest? And then does the patient have effusion, and does that effusion exhibit signs of pericardial tamponade? Okay. Does anyone have any questions?